First Kings chapter 18. Sad to say, and somewhat surprising to me, people still don't understand. They still don't see that the problems and the tensions in the Middle East today are not because of politics or race or economics or the establishing of a new state. Those are not the things that are fanning the flames and fueling the fire in that tinderbox of the Middle East that we're all concerned about worldwide. It's none of those things. CNN doesn't have a clue, quite frankly. And the commentators really don't understand that the issue in the Middle East is not economical or political, but in reality, it's spiritual. There is, you see, a confrontation going on in the Middle East. That confrontation is between the true and living God, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, and the moon God, the false God, a God by the name of Allah. And in essence, what we see taking place today in Israel and in the Middle East is a great confrontation between the true and living God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the moon God, Allah. Such confrontations, though, are nothing new. Such confrontations have been taking place in Israel for millennia. And in our text, we see a confrontation between the true and living God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and a false God, a God by the name of Baal. The people in Israel were worshiping the true and living God, but they would also give credence to and make sacrifices to this God Baal as well. And they were vacillating back and forth about which God to serve. And actually, many in that country were saying, we can serve both gods simultaneously. Well, this is where our story picks up in our text today. First Kings chapter 18, beginning at verse 17. It came to pass when Ahab, King Ahab, the wicked king of Israel, who was married to a wicked queen named Jezebel. King Ahab saw Elijah, the prophet of the true and living God. And when he saw Elijah, he said, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? At this time, in these days, there was a famine in Israel because of a drought that had been going on for three years. The skies produced no rain. There was drought and dryness in the land. And the king looks at Elijah and says, Are you the one that's caused the problem around here? And Elijah answers back, verse 18, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house in that you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and you have followed Balaam, or Baal. You're the problem, Ahab. You've turned away from the true and living God, and you've begun to worship Baal and other false gods. So Elijah goes on to say in verse 19, So send and gather to me all Israel unto Mount Carmel, a mountain there, in northern Israel, on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. A very beautiful spot. Come with us. We'll take you there. Gather all the people to Mount Carmel and the prophets of Baal, which numbered 450, and the prophets of the groves. Those prophets were prophets to Ashtaroth, who was the goddess of sensuality, the goddess of immorality, conducting their immoral practices in groves, shady areas. It was kind of a shady religion, you see. And so these prophets, 400 prophets of Ashtaroth, the groves, and 450 prophets of Baal, 
were told to come to Mount Carmel. So Ahab did just that, verse 20. He sent unto all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together there at Mount Carmel. And as the crowd gathers and the prophets, the teams arrive, we see the setting for a grand confrontation between God and Baal. It's going to be a super confrontation. It's a super Baal. Super Baal one, actually. The whole nation is there for this great confrontation. Super Baal one. Who's going to win? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or Baal and Ashtaroth? That's the question. Before kickoff, Elijah looks at the people, verse 21. This massive congregation, this packed stadium, if you would, and he says, how long halt ye between two opinions? You're going back and forth. You're straddling the fence. You're saying, oh, well, Baal, God, what's the difference, you see? How long will you do this, Elijah says? He says in verse 21, if the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. It was eerily silent. The people heard what Elijah said and wanted to see what would happen next in this confrontation. Well, Elijah says, let's take verse 23, two bullocks, and let them, the prophets of Baal, choose one and cut it to pieces and lay it on the wood, and I will take the other bullock and cut it to pieces and lay it on the wood. And you, verse 24, call upon the name of your gods, and I will call upon the name of the Lord. And the God that answereth by fire, let him be God. And all the people answered and said, it is well, okay. We'll have two sacrifices. You offer your sacrifice to Baal. I'll offer this sacrifice to the true and living God. And we'll see who sends fire from heaven to consume the sacrifice, that will be an indication of who the true God truly is. The other one, the other God, the loser, has got to be fired, quite literally. <laughs> no go if the fire doesn't come, if the fire doesn't fall. We'll all know, you see. So, they agreed to that. They took the bullock, those prophets of Baal, Verse 26, and they dressed it out and they called upon the name of Baal from morning even till noon time. So for hours they make their prayers. They call upon their God to send fire from above. But, verse 26 says, there was no voice nor any answer. So then they leaped upon the altar which was made. They began to leap on the altar, trying to get the attention of their God. It came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them. Elijah's standing by, watching these fellas make fools of themselves, jumping up and down, dancing all around, trying to get the attention of Baal. And he said, Elijah declared, cry aloud, increase the volume. For he is a God, and perhaps he is talking, or maybe he is pursuing. Cry louder, perhaps he's talking with somebody else and doesn't hear you. Or perhaps he's pursuing, new translations render that, maybe he's in the restroom. Maybe you need to cry louder, maybe he's preoccupied in the facilities, you see. So cry louder. Or maybe he's on a journey. Or perhaps he's sleeping and must be awakened. Elijah is mocking these prophets who are trying to make something happen. The prophets then cried louder, 28 says, and they cut themselves after their manner with knives and lancets till the blood gushed out upon them. Trying to get the attention, these are wild men worshiping their false god. Dancing around cutting themselves up, blood flowing. It's brutal. It's ugly. It's grotesque. Not unlike what we see happen in the Middle East today. 
in areas where Allah is worshipped and the cries are horrific and the blood flows and the murder is undeniable. It's awful. And yet these guys were doing those kinds of things here on this day, in this confrontation, you see. Well, it came to pass, verse 29 tells you and me, when midday was past, and they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. So now they've gone all day with not a peep from Baal, you see. There was no voice, nor any answer, nor any attention. Now Elijah says, it's my turn. Elijah then builds the altar, takes the bullock, dresses him out as this sacrifice is now being made to the true and living God. Then he does something remarkable. He says, grab some water barrels and drench the sacrifice and the wood and the altar with water to make it even more difficult to see. And so they did just that. Three times they took water and drenched the sacrifice and the wood on the altar. And they even put a trench around the altar and filled that with water too. And when they were done, when this was completed, it came to pass, verse 36, that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, or Jacob, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God, and that thou hast turned their heart back again. A simple prayer. It takes 15 seconds to say slowly and carefully. Here the prophets of Baal screamed and cut themselves and hollered and cried all day. Elijah offers a prayer that's simple. It takes 15 seconds or so to say. And when he prays this simple prayer, we read in verse 38, Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust that was on the ground and licked up the water that was in the trench. Man, that's something. I can't wait to see the DVD in heaven. That must have been something. Super Baal won. The Lord God of Israel was the winner, you see, without question. The sacrifice consumed, the wood disappears, the stones are burnt up, even the water is licked up by the fire that came from heaven that day. And when the people saw this, verse 39 says, they fell on their faces and they said, the Lord, he is the God. The Lord, he is the God. They knew, without a question that day, that there was a difference between their God, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and the God of the pagan peoples that made their way into Israel and demanded their gods to be worshipped too. We see the same thing being replayed today. There is the true and living God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Israel, the God of the Jew, and the God of the Christian too. For he is the true and living God and the Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But today, in the news, all of us are aware that there seems to be this CNN confusion coming down, this CNN confusion going on, where people say Islam and Judaism, Christianity, they're all monotheistic religions. They all worship one God, the same God. Not true. Not so. The God of Islam is a false God. Muhammad, you see, in the 600s, in his desire to unify the Arab tribes that were nomadic in nature, scattered everywhere, Muhammad made his way to Mecca one day, the most holy city now for the people 
in Islam. And he went into the Kaaba, which is still, to this day, Islam's most holy site there in Mecca. And the Kaaba was a pantheon where many gods, hundreds of gods, were worshipped by various tribes that lived in the Arabian Peninsula. And what Muhammad did is he chose one god from that pantheon of gods, one idol, Allah, the moon god. And that is why the symbol of Islam today is just that, a crescent moon. And he would say, this is the God that all will worship. This is the God that will unify our people. This is the only God. But he chose that God from a host of pagan gods, so-called. And then he went about to conquer the people in the Arabian Peninsula under the banner of the crescent moon in the name of the moon god, Allah. And he demanded that all that he encountered submitted to Allah. That's what Islam means, submission. And it is not talking about a spiritual submitting, a choice one makes. It's talking about you must submit, either willingly or by the edge of the sword. You must bow the knee or your head will be lopped off your body, you see. And Muhammad himself went about demanding that people submit to this God that he declared was the God to be worshipped. And those that didn't would lose their lives. He personally killed thousands of Arabians who did not submit to his moon God, Allah, you see. Now, the centuries have passed. Time has gone on. The confusion is great. And people say, well, you know, there really isn't any difference between the God of the Jew and the God of Islam. The God that we worship and the God that they proclaim. But there is. Those that teach Islam point out that there are three chief characteristics of Allah. If you have a pencil and paper, you might want to jot these down if you get in discussions with others about these things. But at least listen carefully and be aware of these characteristics that people say that those that teach Islam say are the key characteristics of Allah. Number one, he is, Allah is, number one, the unknowable one. The unknowable one. What do you mean? He transcends men, and he cannot be known by men. He is, Allah is, the unknowable one. He transcends men, and he cannot be known by men. This is what those that teach Islam say. This is what their holy men, holy men, pardon me, teach. He is the unknowable one. What about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Is he unknowable? Oh, great is the mystery of godliness, the scriptures declare, that God was manifest in the flesh, that God became one of us, lived among us, talked to us, and then died for us in the person of Jesus Christ. Great is this mystery, that God is known by all through his son, you see. You might recall what one of Jesus' disciples said to him in the upper room the day before Jesus was crucified. Philip said to Jesus, show us the Father and it will suffice us. We want to know and understand and see the Father, see the God of Abraham. Jesus said, Philip, have I been with you so long? Don't you know that he that hath seen me hath seen the Father? I and the Father are one. You can know everything that you need to know about God, Jesus would say, by looking at me. I've been here with you day after day after day. You've heard my words. You've seen my works. You know my love as Jesus would then go to the tree on Mount Calvary and die for them and die for you and die for me. Listen, Allah is 
they say, number one, the unknowable one. Our God made himself known to everyone, to anyone who wants to see by becoming one of us in Jesus Christ. God became a man. Jesus is God. He that hath seen me hath seen the Father, you see. Number two, those that teach Islam and Islamic theology say that Allah is not only the unknowable one, but that Allah is, secondly, the all-powerful one. He can do anything. That's not true with our God, the true and living God. What did you say, Pastor John? Did I hear you correctly? You're saying our God cannot do everything? True. Allah, we are told, can do anything. Allah can do everything. But the true and living God, that's not true. There are three things that God cannot do. There are three things that the Bible tells me and tells you that God cannot do. Titus chapter 1 verse 2 says, God cannot lie. I like that. God cannot lie. He has designed it in such a way, His very being, that it is impossible for Him to lie. And I'm thrilled about that. Because Muhammad, the propagator and founder of Islam, my goodness, what a liar he was, and justified it in the name of Allah. How so? When Muhammad was going about seeking to conquer the Arab Peninsula, he came to his own tribe, the Quraysh tribe. And at that time, Muhammad had not yet gained enough power to force the Quraysh tribe to submit to him, Muhammad, and to Allah. And so he signed a peace treaty with his own people, with his own tribe. He said that if you don't attack me, I won't attack you. It was a perpetual, permanent peace treaty. But two years later, two and a half years down the road, to be more precise, Muhammad, he gained greater power. His army grew larger, and he went back to that tribe, the Koresh tribe, his own people, and he crushed them. And he wiped out the tribe, and the blood flowed, and horrific things were done, Muhammad himself leading the way. Well, he was challenged about that. You signed a peace treaty with the Koresh people, your own tribe, and you broke it. Muhammad then said no. A tribe, or pardon me, a treaty, a promise, a vow, an oath can and should be broken any time it will further the cause of Islam and glorify Allah. Therefore, he said, I'm justified in changing my mind and destroying this tribe. Now that's interesting. Because you might remember, if you were following the events back then when Bill Clinton was in the White House, how he had Yasser Arafat and Yitzhak Rabin, Arafat of the Palestinian Authority, and Rabin, the Prime Minister of Israel at that time, they met on the White House lawn. They shook hands there, Bill Clinton standing behind them with arms outstretched. You might remember that picture. I'll never forget it. And they signed a peace treaty, you see. Hours later, Yasser Arafat was on TV talking in Arabic, being filmed by a Muslim TV news crew. And when he was asked about this peace treaty that was signed with the Israelis, with the Jews, he said, it's nothing more than Koresh. It's nothing more than Koresh. What's Koresh? It means you can make a treaty, you can make a promise, and you can break it at the right time when you have the golden opportunity. And Arafat is on record as saying just that. That that peace treaty, null and void, it's nothing more than Koresh. Our God, listen gang, our God is not like that. Our God cannot lie. There's something else God cannot do. First of all, God cannot lie. 
It's impossible for him to break his word. It's impossible for him to tell a lie. There's something else God cannot do. He cannot learn. Huh? God cannot learn anything about you or learn anything about me. That is, this is greatly comforting to me. He cannot learn. That is, he already knows who I am, not only where I've been, but where I'm going to be. Therefore, nothing surprises him about me. You might be surprised to learn about someone else, or even surprised about what you yourself have done. But you know, God does not learn. He cannot learn. That is why God in the flesh, Jesus Christ, he said to Peter one day, when Peter said, Lord, even though everybody else forsakes you, I won't. You can count on me. And I'm the first pope. You know, Lord, you can count on me. And the Lord looked at Peter and said, Peter, I tell you the truth. Before the cock crows three times, Peter, you're so cocksure of yourself. You're as proud as a rooster crowing about your loyalty. But I tell you, before the cock crows, before the rooster crows three times, you will have denied me thrice. Peter, I know all about you. And sure enough, the time came when Jesus was carried away from the Garden of Gethsemane by the temple guard that evening, brought before Caiaphas and then before Pontius Pilate, where ultimately he would be crucified. As he was being tried, Peter was there in the courtyard, warming himself by the enemies of Jesus' fires that they had ignited. Dangerous thing to do. And you know, when they said, aren't you one of his disciples? Aren't you a follower of the Nazarene? Peter said, no. And he swore. He said, no, once, twice, thrice. And he swore, oh, I'm not talking about cursing. It is, he took an oath, my soul be damned if I know him. And after he said that the third time, the cock crew, the rooster crowed right then. And he listened to that crowing of the rooster. Simultaneous with that, Jesus was led out of Caiaphas' house. Led out of that place on his way to where Pontius Pilate would be. And Peter had just denied him for the third time. Now Jesus comes out and looks at Peter. And it says Peter wept bitterly. Because the look was not, hmm, what did you do? But the look was, Peter... That doesn't surprise me. I know all about you. I told you this would happen. And it broke Peter's heart. Listen, God cannot learn. The true and living God cannot learn. Nothing surprises him about you or me. The Lord cannot learn. The third thing God cannot do. The true and living God. He cannot lie. He cannot learn. And he cannot Remember the sins I've done. I love this. The Bible says when we receive the grace of God and plead the blood of His Son, that His blood, the blood of Jesus Christ, cleanses me so completely and cleanses you so thoroughly that God declares, Your sin and iniquity will I remember no more. The blood of his son erases his memory of the sins that I did yesterday or am doing presently or might do tomorrow too. The blood of Jesus cleanses us constantly, the Apostle John says in chapter 1. And not only are we forgiven, cleansed, but he doesn't remember the sins that I've done. When I go before him, I say, oh Lord, I've blown it again. He would say, what you talking about again? I don't remember you blowing it before. Really, Lord? Uh-uh. Your sins and iniquities will I remember no more. That is grand. God truly cannot remember my sins. That's good news. I'm really thrilled about that. It's true. God cannot remember sin 
that was done by you and by me, those of us that have believed in Jesus and have been washed in the blood that was shed on Calvary, he cannot remember. I'm so glad about that. So Allah, the Islamic teachers say, is unknowable. The true and living God has made himself known to you and me through Jesus Christ, his son. Allah can do anything. The true and living God cannot. He cannot lie. He cannot learn. And he cannot remember the sins that we've done. <laughs> I'm thankful about that. Finally, the third thing that is foundational in Islamic thought. Allah, they say, is the unknowable one. Secondly, he's the all-powerful one. And finally, he's the all-knowing one. He knows everything. But you know, that's not so with the true and living God. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God and Father of our Savior, Yeshua, or Jesus Christ. What do you mean? God, our God, doesn't know everything. Four things, really quickly. Number one, he does not know a sin he does not hate. He does not know a sin he does not hate. God hates sin. He does not know a single one that he does not hate. See, sometimes we say, oh, you know, I know I shouldn't do this or go there, but that's okay. Hey, I can sort of butter up God and, hey, it's going to be fine. Listen, God does not know a sin he does not hate because he knows. He knows what will happen. There's a finger that is going to be pointing right at you. There's a finger that's going to be sickening to me. God knows that. And as we've said time and again, sin, sin, sin. Sin is not bad because it's forbidden. Sin is forbidden because it's bad. God does not know a sin he does not hate. Secondly, he does not know a sinner he does not love. I like that. God does not know a sinner he does not love. Allah, die infidel, was the cry of Muhammad and his followers. If you don't submit, you die. Jesus, God in the flesh, God among us, Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus, well, they're in Gethsemane. The night before he was crucified, as he was praying in the garden, for you and for me. Judas, the worst person who ever lived on the face of the planet. The one who's called the son of perdition, or the son of waste, a big waste. Judas, betrayed a man that he knew was completely and totally innocent. Judas, he came to the garden, followed by temple soldiers, with their shields gleaming and the flames flickering, Judas came to Jesus and kissed him on the cheek. And Jesus looked at Judas and didn't say, Die, infidel! Jesus looked at Judas and said, Friend, what seekest thou? He called Judas. In the moment of Judas betraying of Jesus, the worst thing that has ever happened in the history of humanity without question. He looked at Judas and what did God, Jesus, God in the flesh say? Friend, friend, what are you doing? Seeking to give Judas yet another opportunity to think through, to turn back. That's, that's our God. God he does not know a sin he does not hate, but he does not know a sinner he does not love. And none of you, I don't care who you are, who you might be, none of us are worse than Judas, I guarantee. And God, in the flesh, Jesus Christ, looked at Judas and said, Friend, not infidel, not die, not the cry of Mohammed, and his God, the moon God, Allah, you see. The third thing that God does not know, he does not know a sin he does not hate, he does not know a sinner he does not love, he does not know another way to be saved. See, many religions say, many people think, 
Well, Buddhism, Islam, Christianity, Confucianism, Zoroasterism, whatever it might be, hey, all the roads will get you to heaven. So let's just all get along. What do you say? But that's so wrong. God does not know another way to heaven. Jesus said, all others are thieves and robbers. He declared, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. The book of Acts proclaims there is no other name under heaven whereby men must be saved. And Jesus, in the Garden of Gethsemane, what did he do? Father, if it be possible, he prayed passionately with blood breaking out on his forehead and running down his face. If there's any other way, if it be possible, let this cup of suffering pass from me. But there was no other way. And he took the cup and he went to the cross because there was no other way for a man or woman to be saved. No other religion deals with the core issue of sin. 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 Only the Lord himself, God, became a man. The man became a lamb. Behold the lamb who takes away the sin of the world when the lamb was slaughtered on the cross sacrificially and shed his blood to cleanse you and to cleanse me. If there was any other way as the son was praying with blood flowing down his face in Gethsemane that day, if there was any other way, God would have answered the prayer that his son prayed in the garden. There is no other way. God does not know another way. Finally, God does not know a sin he does not hate. God does not know a sinner he does not love. Even Judas God does not know another way by which men may be saved. And finally, fourthly, God does not know a better time for you to be born again than today. There is not a better time. He does not know a better time. You see, the book of Hebrews chapter 4 says, Today is the day of salvation. Harden not your hearts. See, here's the deal. If you hear a message like this, and somehow it rings true, it's not because of persuasive speaking or eloquent preaching. That's not so. That's not true. It's because the Holy Spirit is speaking to you. And the Holy Spirit is saying it's true. There is no other way that your sins are going to be forgiven. There's no other way way for you to spend eternity in heaven. It's not through just any religion that you believe sincerely. You can be sincere in believing in Allah, but you're sincerely mistaken. And the Holy Spirit's speaking to some. And if you hear that voice, you feel that tug, you're, you're aware that somehow he's, he's pulling on the strings of your heart this evening. God does not know a better time than right now, today, if you hear his voice. Harden not your heart. Because if you do, if you harden your heart today, perhaps this is the day that your heart will become permanently calcified and it will be impossible for you to ever respond to an invitation like this. The Bible does say there comes a point when the Holy Spirit is blasphemed. God said in Genesis, my spirit will not always strive or work with men. There comes a time when a person says no once too often. Or just says, I'm going to wait till another time. But the other time will never come. So God would say, I don't know. I do not know of a better time, a better day, than this time today. Today, if you hear his voice, the Bible says, harden not your hearts as, as they did in the days of provocation. So, precious people, 
This is the time. How long will you halt between two opinions? How long will you say, well, maybe Christianity is true, maybe Islam's okay, maybe Buddha's kind of a cool guy, I don't know, maybe all the roads lead there. Listen to what Elijah would say if he were here. How long will you halt between two opinions? If Allah be God, if Buddha be God, if Confucius be God, follow them. But if the Lord, the true and living God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ be God, then serve him. Choose you this day whom you will serve. And all I have to say is, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. The true and living God. Our God. So much different than Allah and all others. There's only one who has dealt with the issue of sin. Only one who who loves you just like you are and yet will come and change you from within. Only one who can cause you this day to have a fresh start and to be born again. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Choose this day and I hope you make a wise choice. In Jesus' name I pray.